Hey guys, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining. This is the Autonomous Database Learning Lounge. I'm Marco Sanasibia, part of the product management team for Autonomous Database. And today we have a very special session on hidden gems of database tools uh, in Autonomous Database. So uh, I'll make sure that I uh, get this session uh, recording for you guys uh, later on, probably next week. So for the um, agenda today, For the agenda today, uh, we have the the one and only uh, Jeff Smith. Uh, he's a distinguished product manager. Um, he's going to give us a tour on the database tools and show several of the components that you might not really realize it's there or the new things that we have, you know, released uh, in the past few months, things that are uh, new, right? And then you actually might find very useful. Uh, throughout the session, we're going to have an open Q&A. So if you have a question, make sure to type them in the Q&A box, okay, of Zoom. Um, we're gonna post some links in chat as well to you guys, uh, so keep an eye on that. Uh, and um, before we start, there are a few important links that um, I'd like you guys to bookmark for um, autonomous database in general, okay? So I'm gonna post those uh, in the webinar chat. Um, again, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, uh, Jeff, uh, for joining us today, uh, this early in, in, in his, uh, <laughs> in his time zone, uh, Jeff, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to let you share your screen and, and thank you for joining again and welcome. You bet. So I see many friends and colleagues on the call today. I think we have a mixed audience of, uh, customers and, and people here at Oracle and everything I'm about to share is good for public consumption, which is good because this is going out on the YouTube. If you have questions, uh, there's a Q&A mechanism. Uh, we invite you to use that. If you work here at Oracle, Marco said I was the one and only Jeff Smith. I'm actually one of about six Jeff Smiths at Oracle. Um, don't forget my middle initial, although it should be easy to find me on Slack. For those of you who don't work here at Oracle, uh, sorry. Um, we are hiring, so look, look for job postings. But if you want to reach me, the easiest way to do that is I'm on X, formerly known as Twitter, or you, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, and I run a blog at thatjeffsmith.com. I'm always happy to hear from our customers. So uh, the topic today, um, hidden gems, uh, features that we put into the database tooling, and I should probably explain what we mean by database tools. Um, so... At the foundation of everything my my team now does uh, is REST APIs. And we have a technology called Oracle REST Data Services or ORDS. Not that it matters what we call it. Uh, really what the job of ORDS is, is to provide secure performant access to things in your database via HTTPS. And, and normally that means via REST APIs. So I'm going to talk more about what we have done in Autonomous to make your database as usable, extensible, developer-friendly as possible. And most of that's around REST APIs. There's also a bit around SQL Developer Web or um, Database Actions. That's the web interface that you see. Um, if you go from the console and click the easy link button, and it'll log in as admin to a SQL worksheet. That's all back-ended by REST APIs. And the tooling that's in there has been developed over the decades since 2005. The things that we've put into the desktop tools, the command line tools have been flipped into uh, the web interface. So that's what I wanted to concentrate on today. Now, I am a crowd pleaser. So if people have questions kind of outside the space I'm in, feel free to put those into the Q&A and I'll try to take them as we go. And then also, this is the autonomous... Um, insider kind of baseball, you know, podcast thing. So I'm assuming most people are here are using autonomous or thinking about using autonomous, but you might have databases um, on your laptop in your own data centers. Um, you might have projects that are getting ready to spin up outside of Oracle cloud that you might want to lift and shift or migrate to Oracle autonomous at one point. Um, most of what I'm going to share today is available um, outside of autonomous. It's just not set up by default. So you'd have to stand it up and maintain it and monitor it. So I'm going to 
assume everyone's in the uh, autonomous world today, but if you have questions about how this technology extends um, to on-premises environments, I'm happy to, um, to take those too. All right, so before I just jump into REST APIs, not everyone's really familiar with what a REST API is. It's not a, it's not a protocol, it's an architectural um, pattern. So we take things or objects and we represent them um, in these APIs. So when you look at a URL or the, the Uniform Resource um, Indicator URI, it's, it's generally talking about uh, a place or a thing. You know, so if I had slash employees, um, that is an object that's being modeled. And then I'm going to perform verbs or actions against employees. Like I might choose to get my employees, which would return a list of the people that work here. Or I might choose to, I see Sean's here. I might decide to delete Sean. That that sounds harsh. Um, I'm decided it's time for Sean to retire. So I'm going to do a delete on the employees resource where employee ID equals Sean. Um, or I might decide, hey, you know what? That was, that was really mean of me. Sean's awesome. Really what he needs is a raise. So I'm going to perform a post or a put on the employee's resource slash Sean and say, hey, you know what, his salary, we need to bump it up like 1.5 1, 1. times. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm making all of these um, calls via the HTTP protocol, which is an actual protocol. And the way that we're interacting with HTTP doesn't make it REST by default, but if we follow the RESTful paradigm, um, then it's really easy for other developers to jump on and use our APIs because they behave in the way we think they should behave. So for example, if I wanted to hire an employee, I could do a post to the employee's resource. And what would come back is a very friendly, hey, 201 status code, we, we added that employee you asked for. And oh, by the way, here's a link that you can follow to go see the details or interact with that employee we just hired. Um, some people think just having an HTTPS interface um, to something makes it a REST API or makes it RESTful. Um, and you'll you'll see people kind of running real fast at the beginning and kind of getting themselves in trouble because, yeah, they'll have a post request, but sometimes they'll put verbs instead of nouns in the things that they're modeling. Or when they're trying to add a resource to a collection, all that you'll get back is something like a 200 OK. There's no link there to say, Where's that thing I just added? Maybe um, I just had to um, refile my taxes and I'm, I'm in the website and I'm clicking go. I would have been quite upset if my, if my tax software had just said, okay, um, instead of actually sending me, hey, successfully submitted, here's the link you can follow to keep track of updates to whether or not Uncle Sam's gonna be cool with your um, submission. So, that's just a really quick, brief, hopefully not too awkward overview of, of REST APIs. It, we could really have an entire hour on this. And I'm guessing if you're a developer, you've used REST APIs before, and there's even a good chance that you've maybe have implemented and built some REST APIs. Um, one of the reasons REST is so ubiquitous is just because of how compatible and easy HTTPS the protocol is to use. So literally almost any framework, any programming language, any environment can interact with HTTP. And when you marry that with the awesomeness that is the Oracle database, you're now able to work with your data, work with objects in the database, uh, harness the application logic you might have defined in the database as a trigger, a constraint, or just a stored procedure, all without having to set up an Oracle home an Oracle client managing the listener. Um, and it, it even I don't even have to touch the database directly. So from a security and administration standpoint, I feel much more comfortable making the things in my database available to others to use because they're not literally touching the database. They're going through a mid-tier, a web server, and they're interacting via HTTP. And then on all these machines, I don't have to give them TNS names files, and I don't even have to give them Oracle usernames and passwords. So it's one of the easiest ways to get started on a new project is using REST APIs. So that's another reason why this is popular. 
They are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. So um, someone did a study last year and 51% of developer time was spent either working on supporting, building, fixing APIs. Um, and the same study also saw that teams that were API first minded, so API driven development, you know, build good, healthy APIs first and then build the apps around that, um, actually found that the developers are more productive, to integrate with partners faster and are happier. Although I don't know if developers can actually ever be happy. So that sounds a little bit like marketing to me. But if you're curious about these results, um, it is from a somewhat biased point of view, it's from the Postman. Um, group or the company that builds the, the REST API clients. But if you go and survey like Stack Overflow, you'll see similar, um, very high percentage of developers working with REST APIs. So REST is up there on top and you'll see three items below that, something called GraphQL. Uh, so GraphQL sort of brought up as an alternative to REST. REST is very chatty. Um, on a page, you could have 20, 30, 40 requests to go get a list of locations and then departments and then employees and then managers and job histories. Um, and it can be very um, verbose and very wide payloads. So you're getting the entire employee record, the entire department record, the entire um, location record. What GraphQL allows you to do is be very specific about what you're asking for and also to get everything in a single request. So I could get a list of locations, those departments, their managers and employees under them and only get the department name, the city, the employee name, their salary and the department name in a single request. And the reason I'm mentioning GraphQL in this talk is because we're gonna be adding support for GraphQL later this year. Um, and if you wanna learn more about what we're doing later this year, uh, Cloud World in Las Vegas is coming up in a short number of days or even less than two weeks, and our team will be there. So look look for the database tools team in Las Vegas if you're there. Okay, so the way we make REST APIs work in the database, all we're doing is really giving you the ability to speak in HTTPS terms. Our mid-tier technology, which is called ORDS, but you don't really need to know that. That's sitting in your mid-tier where your web servers are at, basically. And it's translating those web requests into requests the database understands. It's then as a database client, just like SQL CL or SQL developer would be, it's, it's establishing and running Oracle database workloads via normal SQL net connections in the database. It's getting the results from those SQL statements, PL SQL programs. Instead of passing them right back down to the client, it's going to paginate the SQL results so you don't overwhelm your mobile phone. It's going to throw on the links that you need for related resources to be clickable so they're RESTful. And it's going to put on the appropriate HTTP status codes. And then finally, it's going to say, instead of sending back a ref cursor, it's going to send back a JSON document or object or array of objects and documents that represent the resource that you've asked for. So in this case, I'm saying, hey, Get me employee number one. We're just going to go, okay, select star from MIMS where ID equals one, and then bring the results of that result set back down as the JSON document with the 200 OK response. So there's no links in there because I didn't code any of the links into the API, but that's in a really small nutshell kind of how our REST APIs work. The developers provide the code behind the APIs and ORDS is sitting there listening for those requests on one or more databases, in your case, one or more autonomous database services. And it's running those workloads and it's translating, you know, things from a JSON object into things the database understands and back. So for example, if I was gonna instead uh, use a stored procedure to get the list of employees, I might pass in um, some headers, or I might have a post request that sends an array or a JSON document on the request. And we'd have to take the things off the JSON document and feed them as inputs to the stored procedure. And then when it spits the ref cursor back out, we have to, again, translate the ref cursor into the, into the JSON. So as a developer, if you're building the REST APIs, really what you're concentrating on is how do I model the things in the database? What verbs do I want to attach to these things? And then what workload do I put underneath those verbs? Like what's the SQL and, and what's the PL SQL? One of the beauties of the Oracle space has us having been around for so long. We have customers that have literally spent 20, 25 years building PL SQL APIs 
for all of their applications. And so when you want to modernize your application stack, say forms to um, mobile apps, all of that code is sitting there ready to just rock and roll. You really many times are just creating little lightweight REST API wrappers on those existing PL SQL packages. And then, then you're just telling your Go developers or your React developers or whatever framework or language that they've fallen in love with, like, hey, here are the APIs you're going to use to interact with the data. So what I really like most about Autonomous, which makes it really easy for me to do demos, for example, is I don't have to have anything on my machine. I just need a browser. So I can spin up an instance and on day zero, minute zero, second 30 of that service having spun up, the mid tier is ready to now sit there and take requests on the database itself. So we here at Oracle are maintaining a fleet of these mid tiers for all of the regions. They're highly available. So we have multiple um, instances of the, of the REST API tech sitting there front-ended by a load balancer. So as your app gets chattier and chattier and busier and busier, it's getting round robined to multiples of those. If for some reason, one of our nodes goes down, the, the, the load balancer goes, oh, node four is not available, you know, take it out of the rotation. And if for some reason um, activity spins way up this fall, maybe online e-tail shopping, you know, we can, the click of a button, you know, deploy multiple additional nodes to increase, to handle the increased workload. So again, as a customer, you're not worried about maintaining the mid tiers, keeping things patched, um, fixing bugs, turning it off and on, logging, instrumenting, all that. We're, we're taking care of that. What you're, what you're working on, what you're responsible for is the data in your database, the stored procedures around that data, and the REST APIs that you're going to use to, to interact with those things. So the other nice thing is when you're ready to start working on these things, it's a single click. You know, Instead of working on the SQL worksheet, you're going to go to this REST workshop and that's where you're going to start defining and building the APIs or documenting them or testing them or whatever it is that your, your role is going to be. So the survey um, Marcos ran earlier is very curious because I've done a survey too. And we were looking at um, actual traffic in our fleet. And we're trying to figure out like what percentage of customers are actually doing heavy work on REST APIs. And I think like 15% of people were saying, I've used it before on a project in Autonomous. Um, now we're seeing more than 15% of our customers in Autonomous actually interacting with their database via REST APIs. But it's not as high as I'd want it to be, which is one of the reasons I suggested we do this webcast today. It's just to let people know, hey, what, what's actually possible with the tech, the gear that we give you um, from Oracle? The other thing is, I, I forgot to mention this, we're one of the few vendors out there that makes this kind of tech available to you out of the box, built by us, supported and provided by us. A lot of the other vendors are going to rely on you to set up a Node.js server, pick up some open source library, and build and run this tech and gear yourselves. We've we've been doing this for our customers since 2011, I think. Our Ord, our Ords tech has been out there and used in, by customers, supported, um, included with your database license um, for more than 10 years now. So this isn't our first rodeo by far. Now, of the percentage of people using ORDS, um, this is a, just a pie chart of the different types of calls that were coming through our mid-tier, like the different types of HTTPS requests. So this isn't in including like canary calls or backend orchestration stuff. This is like literal customer requests. Um, for the month of July, it was nearly 3 billion requests, almost a billion, and it, it's growing over time. 51% of that was REST APIs that they were, um, they've built themselves. Um, now we have some Apex customers out here. Not everyone uses Apex, but a lot of our customers use Apex. Um, a little bit less than half of the requests coming in through um, ORDS was for Apex itself. Now, when you're in Apex building applications, when you're in the REST workshop, building the REST APIs that you're 
Apex apps can use. That's the same technology we're talking about today. Um, but I don't want people to think that you have to use Apex to take advantage of REST APIs. It's just that Apex is one of the best at building native REST API support into the development interface for, for an Oracle dev. Um, some of the other categories of things that are being used here, we have an endpoint that allows you to run ad hoc SQL, PL SQL, and SQL plus scripts. That's REST enabled SQL. That's actually quite popular for integrations. I'll talk about that in a bit. We have something called Soda for REST that allows you to treat the Oracle database as a JSON document store. You know, so if you wanted to be a Mongo style developer, but have, have the awesomeness of the Oracle database backing that, um, that that's ready to go out of the box. And then we have something called um, auto rest in the modules. So the modules are what I was describing earlier, where you define the templates, the handlers, and the code. Auto rest is a lot easier than that. You look at a table, a view, or a PL SQL program, and you right click in the interface and you say enable rest. And then we actually build and support the APIs for you. So you can immediately insert, update, delete, query, batch load rows to tables and views, and you can automatically have remote procedure call endpoints for all of your stored procedures. So we handle, um, there's no, literally no code writing on that. So it's the easiest way to hello world, and it's the easiest way to quickly stand up um, an app. Maybe I'm over talking this a bit, but just real quickly, um, if you build good APIs, you will have a proven business advantage compared to your competitors. If you make it really easy for your customers to extend what they're paying for, things that you haven't even thought about yet, but you give them good APIs, and also not just customers, but also partners. If you make their data available to them, um, via APIs, they're going to go off and build a bunch of kick butt things that you never even considered, um, but you made it all possible because you're in an API driven development mind frame and all of that groundwork has been laid. Uh, and now it's just up for others to pick up and run with it. If on the other hand, you treat this as a chore, something you have to do, and you put out junk APIs, what you will do is frustrate people they will give up and they'll run away and talk crap behind your back the first chance they get. So it's critical for you, for us, that we give you the tools that you need to build good APIs. And if you do that, you know, great things are gonna happen. So what are some of our customers doing out there? Um, they're doing lots of cool stuff. So REST APIs, really what they can be used for is, is mostly limited to your imagination, but these are things that I've seen multiple, multiple times. So powering microservices, um, here's a popular one, internet of things. So devices, um, in sh in, especially in the um, shipping and logistics, you know, container ships, um, trucks. Um, we, we had a story out of Italy, there was a, um, a supplier in the food industry that was able to put internet of things, um, devices in the trucks, in the actual drawers that the produce was being shipped in, uh, which allowed them to prevent spoilage, um, reduce cost. Um, the stores could actually maintain, you know, what's going on in the actual um, freezers and the actual coolers in the stores so they could actually see when something was about to spoil versus having to go check and open the darn door every, you know, 10 minutes to see how it was going. All that's made possible because those devices were able to just do simple, you know, get and put and post requests that actually went and fed the data into the Oracle database. And then you have things in the Oracle database like machine learning, analytic functions, um, even AI coming up. Um, all, all of the cool stuff and the power of the database is able to interact with that data and it's coming directly from the, sh literally from the shelf. Um, another big use case, uh, Oracle Fusion. You know, we have lots of industry specific apps and we have things that are like in ERP and sales and, um, even, even our, um, business units like NetSuite, you know, they're using REST APIs a lot. 
they're able to extend what their apps give you out of the box by taking advantage of, for example, the autonomous data warehouse and the built-in REST API support there. So they're using REST APIs to replicate data into their data warehouses, um, actually sync data in both directions. Um, we have customers that have built chatbots that are powered by REST APIs. So when you're literally typing your question to the chatbot, the answer is getting taken care of by a, a post or a GET request um, that the database is interacting with. Um, I don't think database links are bad, but I think a lot of people have been burned by them or uh, you know they're often abused. You can actually bypass database links completely and have the database act as a web client and interact with other Oracle databases via HTTPS. So, you know, you can use REST APIs to enable communication between remote databases. All, all kinds of use cases. And I've noticed um, my friend and boss, Chris Rice, is on the call. So if you have questions, he's there to help me answer them. So I kind of feel like I got a cheat code now. Let's look at some specific customers. So I'm not going to read you every word on these slides. If you want to take a screenshot or come back and watch the recording later, you can you can read these in full. And some of these stories have been published. I can find the links for one. Um, this company, they sell scientific equipment. Uh, they have four million products. Um, they took a on-premises um, application from an on-prem exadata. Thank you, customer. Thanks to all of our Exadata customers out there for being loyal customers. Um, but they wanted the power of all of that managed by Oracle. You know, so an Oracle Autonomous that's that's running on Exadata plus plus. They were able to move that application into the Oracle Cloud on Autonomous, and it was really easy for them because the application was 100% powered by REST APIs. So all of the data is read and written via the, the JSON objects that are coming in and out of the REST APIs. So it's very easy to make them, have them make that move. Um, here's another um, internet of things uh, example. Um, so this is a company that does fleet management. They have um, literal trucks on maps and they can track who's doing what and where they're at. Um, it's interacting with their Oracle ERP system um, all being powered by REST APIs. Um, imagine having to manage a stateful SQL net or JDBC connection on a truck going 70 miles an hour down the highway or you know, in uh, a quarry pit via just having a, a four or 5G radio device on the, on, the, on the truck that can just literally, when it gets a signal, you know, do some post requests and share back to the literal fleet where it's at and and what it's doing. And then they also have, um, I can't remember if it's this is the company that has these, uh, but there are similar companies that have also built mobile apps for the drivers, for the people in the field um, to get these updates as well, all being powered by REST APIs. Uh, this is um, one of the newer success stories we've got. By the way, in terms of success stories, I'm a pig. I'm always looking to suck up as many of these stories as I can. So if you'd like to share with us what you're doing with our tech, I'd love to hear about it. Um, now, you can tell me, Jeff, don't tell anyone else, and I won't do that. I won't share this data unless you've given us explicit uh, permission to share it back. But I, I want to hear what you all are doing. I actually want to hear the good and the bad. I want to hear where you're struggling, what we can do to make it easier for you. But I definitely also want to hear you know, how we've helped you, because this allows us to better plan investment in terms of resources and new features. Um, going forward. Um, but this was um, a customer that's taking data from a, um, a service provider they're using called beware.com, and they were syncing that data into their Oracle database via REST APIs. And they were, it was very easy for them. I think they were able to do it um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, this customer isn't an autonomous, they're an on-premises customer, um, but it's a cool story. So like all of the public sector services um, for Iceland, um, generally around parks and rec, um, specifically targeted to um, kids, preschool kids, high school kids, but also like parents, um, all of their um, sites where they go to sign up kids for football leagues or um, after and um, before day care programs. Um, mobile apps um, with their personal country um, 
identification built in, making REST API calls that are leveraging um, things inside of an Oracle database in their on-premises install. Um, you know, it's very easy for them to say, "Hey, uh, we we need we need some place for Johnny." I mean, they don't call him Johnny in Iceland, but you know, Johnny um, Thor's daughter. You know, to um, Johnny, that doesn't make sense, does it? Not Johnny, Jill. Jill Thor's daughter. You know, needs to. We need to sign her up for um, tennis lessons. So they had a portal where they could sign in and get a list of all of the programs, sign up. And it was all integrated with their token based. Um, as a citizen, they all get like personal ID tokens for all public services, which is really cool. So that was all 100% powered um, by ORDS. And they had built more than 2,000 of these APIs. Um, and they were able to go from doing traditional Java first development to they said really quickly, hey, you know what? This REST API stuff, we can go much faster. And they would actually do literal races with different teams to see who could build these solutions faster. And it was very clear that the REST APIs almost always won. I'm going to skip this last one, but also another cool um, example. I'm going to go into some actual um, features and some actual things that you can leverage that we've built and you can actually start using. Okay, so uh, REST APIs in the database, there's like multiple ways um, that can be leveraged. Actually, I should say HTTPS in the Oracle database with REST APIs being the number one use case. There are other different use cases you can use. Um, I want to cover a couple of those now. So we'll cover the auto REST first. So after I've created my table, put my data into it, or even just created the table, you can, if you want, literally right click there in your console and say, hey, I want to enable REST on this object. And then you're going to get out of the box the ability to get one or more records, query records. Um, so I could say, hey, I only want employees that Jeff has tried to fire in the last 30 days, all by manipulating the URI string in my get request. Um, oh, by the way, I also want it sorted. Um, or I could even say, show me this data as it looked 60 days ago using built-in um, flashback technology without having to write any of this code. I just simply say, rest enable this object. Um, when 23C rolls out, then we'll have access to technology like the JSON relational duality views and then uh, ORDS will also support those views as well. And that adds the ability to do partial updates on individual pieces of those JSON relational duality views via patch requests. So very, very powerful stuff. Um, and then on the PL SQL programs itself, we can right click and enable those and you get a post endpoint to do remote procedure calls against your PL SQL programs. So again, if you've spent 20 years, 10 years, even two years building all of your logic into those PL SQL APIs, it's really easy to now utilize and take advantage of those from literally anywhere. You don't have a mobile app today, but you want to build one. You don't have to write any of the database code. You're just going to write the front end UI code and the mobile app. And when you click the button to go get something out of the database, you're going to make a post request to the stored procedure that goes get you that data via the ref cursor. And it's going to come back as a JSON document. And then your framework you're using in your mobile phone knows how to do the JSON to the fancy UI translation. That's it. That's a gross simplification. I apologize, but that's basically it. Um, if you're a developer and you're a control freak, and you probably are, um, you, it's your code that we're running. So the auto stuff is cool. A lot of people use it. And some people are like, you know what? I prefer just to write my own code. So this is where the, the RESTful and building friendly APIs becomes very important. So I need to maintain um, you know, that you're passing inputs that are friendly. And if not, you know, give exceptions back saying, hey, you made a bad request. Can you send me an actual date for hire date instead of sending me in the person's name? Um, I can control like, hey, you just created the thing. Here's the link to the resource that you want to go look at to play with later. Um, that's all of your code deciding what those inputs look like, what the responses look like. Um, and you're only limited by two things. One, what the Oracle database can do, which is not much. You know, not much limitations there. The Oracle database can literally do almost anything, um, regardless of the type of data 
or workload that you're dealing with. The real limitation is, you know, your abilities as a SQL and PL SQL developer. So for me, my examples are also pretty simple because my abilities don't extend out that far. Um, but for folks that do this all day, every day, you know, you're going to start rocking and rolling with your REST APIs very quickly. As soon as you pick up what's expected of you to have those friendly RESTful APIs and you go from a, a stateful environment to a stateless environment, or you move from like SQL net to HTTPS, there's a little bit of catch up you need to do there, but the actual, you know, coding bits are, are trivial. Uh, REST enabled SQL. So this is that endpoint we give you to take ad hoc, not necessarily ad hoc, but, um, Workloads that aren't predefined. So the workload is predefined when you publish a REST API. It's built to accomplish a very specific task. Um, REST enabled SQL is an endpoint that says, hey, post to us the SQL or PL SQL or SQL scripts, SQL seal scripts you want to run on the database, and we'll go and do that. This is the technology that makes the SQL worksheet and database actions possible. So when you literally type, you know, select star from, enter, begin, dbms output, put line, end, com, colon, slash, execute a script. We take the contents of that, of that screen and, and sling it to this endpoint. We run that, and then we get all the output of that one or multiple statements and bring it back to you again as bunches of um, JSON objects with all the links and, and status codes. So we built this for ourselves, but it's published and available for you as customers. So for example, someone's asked me once, hey, do you have a REST API to create users in the database? And I was like, no, we don't have one out of the box, but you could build your own using a module, or you could literally just send the create user command to the REST enabled SQL um, that's, that's sitting there running an autonomous ready for you to take advantage of. Um, we have some um, apps integration partners here in Oracle that have used REST-enabled SQL for their users to easily be able to throw data to um, every few minutes or every few hours, as few as 10 records or as many as like 10,000 records um, to keep databases in sync between like their data warehouse and their, uh, their business operations instances. And the beauty of the REST enabled SQL is they don't actually have to publish anything into the customer's database. They can literally just kind of build like a, not a microservice, but like a, a portal that says here, bring the data in and shove it over here to the database on this endpoint. And it's just always there and ready to go. And it's also always secure. If you are allured by the um, promise of flexible schemas, AKA JSON or NoSQL, um, but you want the power of an Oracle database, we have an uh, Mongo API implemented for the Oracle database that's powered by our tech here. Um, we also have something called Soda for REST, um, kind of along the same methodology. You know, I, instead of working with tables and views, I can work with JSON objects and documents. Um, I'm either using the Mongo protocol or I'm using HTTPS, it's your choice. Um, but the other thing we've given you is in database actions or SQL developer web, there's, a, there's literally a JSON screen and I can use the screen to query my documents, um, to update them, to, to load documents. So we give you the UI and we give you the back end, and you can use one or either if you want. So, um, Swagger tooling, or if you've heard of the open API spec, um, these are screens, these are technologies you're going to use once you've been working with REST APIs for more than a few minutes. So one of the cool things you can do is you can use the Swagger tooling to kind of model out the templates, you know, the, the things, the objects, the, the entities that you want to interface in the database, you can kind of draw out the different patterns and verbs and parameters associated with them. They can be represented um, either as YAML or JSON, but if you get the JSON version of that, you can literally import that into your autonomous database in our REST workshop. And we automatically publish for you all of the um, templates and all of the get put post delete 
and upcoming patch handlers that you set aside in your Swagger tooling design. Um, we even give you stub database code to kind of give you an idea of what you might need to do on a Git handler, uh, a select, for example. But this is where you would come in and put in your own database code behind it. But this could literally save you weeks of time um, because you're going to properly design the APIs and, and the proper design tools. And then when you're ready, you're going to import them in here in one fell swoop instead of clicking the next button, you know, 3,700 times. So this is a huge time saver. Now, the other thing you can do is as you're building these REST APIs, you know, uh, using REST APIs in the browser is pretty straightforward. If you're doing GET requests, you can literally just type the address in the browser and hit go and it'll go get that thing. But maybe you want to do a post or a delete. So let's say I wanted to give my friend Sean a raise again. Um, I can pull up um, the Swagger tooling in the database actions interface and it's got a description of the endpoint, but I can click the try it out button and it literally gives me a form. I can say, hey, it's Sean, job is PM, salary, 1 million space credits, um, and click the go button. And it'll do two things. It'll actually execute the request and bring the results back, but it also gives you the equivalent, the equivalent curl command that you would do at say at a, at a command line. So this, this comes in really handy, and it's just a good way to kind of teach yourself the APIs before you actually start going to code them in your apps. Data pump, um, technology that's been around since, was it 9i, maybe 10g, long time. And it's by far the most powerful tool we have for getting data in and out of your database in mass. So really handy if you want to do uh, migrations to autonomous, let's say you had a data pump um, file um, on-prem, if you go and put it in your object store, um, database actions can read your buckets in the object store and create import jobs and handle that for you. So all you have to do is um, enable your autonomous database to act as a resource principal and say, um, hey, we're going to use groups and privileges and roles that you've established in um, your OCI um, space there and treat the database itself as a, um, a resource that can work with other things. And I'm going to create a group with a couple of privs, basically say, hey, I'm going to let members of this group and the members of this group would be the database. I'm going to allow it to read buckets and read objects in those buckets. Those, those would be the dump files. Once I've done that, I can use the database actions data pump card, click the import wizard, and then I'm going to get a list of buckets I can browse. And then in those buckets, I'll have the list of dump files. And then I can walk the wizard just like I would um, in uh, like SQL Developer Desktop. By the way, SQL Developer Desktop also has this ability. Uh, we can browse um, object store buckets and create data pump scenarios. But the nice thing about having it in your browser, you know, your, your database is only been in existence for 10 minutes. I don't want to go download my client or set up an, an ACL or private endpoints. I just want to go right into the browser and start playing with stuff. You know, having this tooling built into the browser is nice, but we, we build the tooling to make you happy at the command line on the desktop, soon to be in VS code as an extension. And of course also as REST APIs. So it, it's literally up to you how you want to um, take advantage of this stuff. Um, this might be one of my favorite features in all of ORDS. You know, when we do the REST enabling on a table, one of the endpoints we give you is a post um, with a batch load parameter. And what this does, it allows you to sling CSV to a table, and we batch load that CSV as new rows into the table. So it literally kind of looks like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this data into this table click the button. I do need to describe the data a little bit so I can say, hey, you're going to encounter some dates and they look like this. Apologies to our friends in Europe. Um, this is not your date format, but you just pick the format that makes sense to you. Sling it over. And what comes back is uh, basically kind of like what you would see at the end of a SQL loader scenario. Um, this is a very small scenario. I've done testing on a very uh, the least powered autonomous instance you can have an always free tendency. 
And I was able to batch load 10 million records in less than 30 seconds from my house here in North Carolina to my autonomous instance running in the Ashburn data center. So like 400 miles away, I batch loaded 10 million records with the click of a button and not set up anything in SQL net or TNS names or, or anything like that. And this is literally what our customers are doing, except they're not pointing and clicking buttons. They're setting up webhooks, they're setting up functions, they're setting up automation tasks, CID, CICD pipelines to automate this stuff. And the data is coming from, the normal place data comes from Excel spreadsheets in some places, because yay Excel, but also from Internet of Things and batch jobs from other systems or, you know, again, use your imagination. Almost done here. Um, We've had this feature in the tool for a long time. This isn't even really about REST APIs in general. Of course, it's powered by REST APIs. Um, I see a lot on our internal Slacks and then also out on Twitter and Stack Overflow, people are asking questions about some of the cloud-specific packages or APIs that are in the autonomous database. So there's dbms underscore cloud. Uh, there's dbms underscore share. There's a few other of those. Wicked powerful. And they're always asking me, hey, how do I do this? And where do I find the docs for that? Well, the docs are built into the database. Um, you just might not know how to find it. So build into database actions. There's a search button up top. Literally type in the name of your package, hit go. We'll figure out, oh, by the way, you might have thought that was in um, the sys schema, but actually it's in a common schema, C pound pound ADP service. And then we filter down the object list, and I can literally read and browse the package spec. And our Oracle application developers here are quite good about having very nicely detailed package specs. This is basically the same version of the doc you would find in Oracle Docs. You can use this browser to find tables, open tables, and fix Sean's salary on the fly You know, by point and clicking a grid versus doing a post request if you want. DBMS scheduler, almost um, about the same age as data pump, I think. I think those were both 9i or 10g editions. Um, the, the scheduler in autonomous allows you to do exactly what sounds like scheduled things. So jobs that can fire off stored procedures, even SQL plus scripts. And in your tenancy, you might have dozens, hundreds, even thousands of these jobs scheduled. There's a full interface built into database actions that allow you, allows you to manage these. So as jobs have been running, um, we keep track of that. And so we've built nice reports over those job histories, and you can actually drill into a specific iteration of a job and get the log from that job. Um, a more interesting way of looking at it, instead of backwards, look forward. Hey, you know, what am I running next week? And do I have any like really intensive stuff that's like going to step over each other? Like, do I have a job that's going to be running the exact same second as another job that's going to be fighting for resources? Um, so we have a, um, a calendar view that allows you to forecast going forward what's going to be running when. And then also we have scheduler chains. So scheduler chains allow you to take multiple things together and fire them off as like a single unit. And so we have really cool diagramming technology. Um, so we do this for your JSON documents. We do this for your relational diagrams. And we also support this for your scheduler chain. So as a developer, you can really see what someone else has built or what you've built um, and even get like documentation out on your chains. Marcus, I've been talking a lot. I've managed to fill the hour. That's cool. We have a couple of questions. Um, real quick before I run away laughing, um, if you want to learn more about REST APIs, we have two labs in Live Labs, build and secure REST APIs. So you'll go from nothing to REST enabling a table to also building your own REST module with PLSQL. And then at the end of that, securing it with OAuth 2. That's a good 60 or 70 minute lab. Um, that's going to be um, available live in person at Cloud World if you're going to be there. But of course, you can take it anytime you want. And then also the second one will also be at Cloud World. This is where the conceit is you're a Python app, Python app dev. You want to use the popular Flask framework to build a web app. Um, we'll, we'll source spatial data out of the database and build interactive um, graphs all via REST APIs. So 
If you want to learn even more on that, you can go to oracle.com slash rest. Um, there's a, a button there you can click that says docs. Um, you can Google Oracle database rest APIs and look for stuff from uh, Chris Rice or myself. And if you're just lazy, you can, you can ping us on um, Slack internally or externally on LinkedIn and Twitter or X, and we're, we're happy to talk to folks. Okay. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, this was excellent. Uh, there were a couple of questions answered already. Um, Ron was asking about the difference between the REST enabled SQL. Uh, yeah, let me rewind mm -hmm. real quick because I can't remember what came before REST enabled SQL. REST API modules, the workload is known in advanced. It's hard coded. I physically defined an API to do a very specific task. I'm expecting specific inputs. I'm going to run a specific block of code, and the output is generally always going to be the same. So you build those in advance. You build apps around those things. You're good to go. But what if your app needed to do something and you didn't have an API for it? Are you screwed? Not necessarily. We also have REST-enabled SQL. So your app could make an ad hoc call to an endpoint and in the request, you're supplying the code you want to run. So it's not hard coded. It's not known before ahead of time. It's not a specific endpoint for specific task. It's literally an endpoint for anything that user has the privileges to run in the database. It could be, um, well, not an autonomous, but in an on-premises database, it could be an endpoint that clones a pluggable database or fails over a data guard instance from standby to primary. It could be truncating a table. It could be creating a table or a user um, used with discretion, um, properly secured. Um, and if you find that you're doing something over and over again, much, much better to build a REST API module for that so it can be properly tuned, secured, and monitored versus this ad hoc person out here just you know taking anything you sling to it. By the way, you don't have to use this endpoint. It's just there for your use if, um, if you choose to use it. Awesome. Excellent. All right, guys. So if you still have questions, uh, keep them coming. In the meantime, just wanted to get your feeling for uh, today's session. So, um, all right, guys. So, again, important links for you guys to bookmark. Um, if you were not here at the beginning of the call, I'm going to put them in um, the chat again, just um, so you guys can copy uh, those links. Um, the links. Um, so, final thoughts. Uh, at the end of the day, we're going to have uh, the recording. Plus, uh, all the links that uh, Jeff had on his slides are going to be part of the bit.ly slash ADB Learning Lounge. Uh, and we have a, a blog specifically about also that includes the, the YouTube recording and all the links um, and description and access to the slides as well in, in PDF format. Okay. So um, I think that's it. So I'll leave the, this open um, for more a minute more. Next week, we have uh, the um, Hidden Gem session for Americas on Tuesday, and we have the data sharing session on Wednesday for uh, EMEA, okay? So again, thank you very much, guys, for joining. Thank you, Jeff, for the uh, excellent presentation. Um, and again, I'll leave this open for uh, a little while uh, and uh, to see if there's any other question, but... Um, in the meantime, see you guys uh, next week. Thank you. Appreciate it.